If you are a woman, I would love for you to come hang out with Tanya Nichols and I on August 26th at 7 p.m. Central Time for a live meetup to dig deeper into the topic of women, money, and retirement. You can learn more and register at livewithroger.com. Do you want to have the confidence to truly rock retirement? Well, I'm going to show you how on the Retirement Answer Man Show. Hello, welcome to the show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. Good to hang out with you here for 30 minutes to an hour. Who knows? So the tagline to this show is having the confidence to rock retirement. Having the confidence to rock retirement. Well, choosing the right withdrawal strategy is a big component of you having that confidence. And the right withdrawal strategy for you may not be the one that your really smart friend uses. It may not be the one that you just read about. It may not be the one that your advisor is recommending because everybody's going to have a different withdrawal strategy and they're going to have certain things about themselves that make a certain strategy fit so that they can have the confidence to retire. Because if you have a really well thought out withdrawal strategy, say that your advisor recommends, but it doesn't really give you the confidence so you feel like you're going to be okay, it doesn't matter how optimized and correct it is if it doesn't free you from the worry and the angst so that you can rock retirement. There's some, a lot of science to this, but there's a lot of art too. And we're going to build a framework in the main section, hopefully to help you begin to navigate finding the one that gives you that confidence. Now, next week on the show, we start our month-long series on women in retirement. I'm very surprised we haven't done this theme before. So I think it's long overdue. And we're going to have Tanya Nichols, a certified financial planner from Align Financial, be with us for the entire month. I've been thinking about the goals, what I would like to accomplish during this episode. And obviously is make it meaningful for you, you individually. So if you're a lady talking about some of the differences between men and women and in planning and how they think about life, et cetera, not that there's a one size fits all, acknowledge those differences and also acknowledge some of the hurdles that women have to go through when they're managing assets either on their own or they're managing assets for their family or they are participating because the spouse is managing the assets. There are hurdles that are systematic in terms of the financial advice industry and how women have been treated in the past and sometimes how they're dismissed even now. So we want to acknowledge that and figure out how to navigate that. And we're going to try to be just open-minded about how to think through this. So that's one objective. The other objective is if you are not a woman, which is about half the population, understanding this perspective. So you as a participant in the household, whatever your role is, can be part of the solution in navigating all of this. And so I'm excited to have Tanya on. And now if you have a perspective that you would like to share or a question around this subject, please go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger and share your perspective or your experience or your question. And we'll try to incorporate those within the show so we can think through this together because we're just going to try to think through this together. So I'm excited about that. But with that, let's get to our main segment talking about how do you actually find the strategy that fits for you? One of the hurdles in retirement planning for individuals when they're getting serious about it and they're about to make the leap is sticker shock. Looking at how much it's actually going to cost to live in retirement. It's not unheard of when you're doing long-term planning, when you look at a 60-year-old couple and you're calculating the costs with inflation and taxes over the lifespan of their retirement to have a price tag of like five and a half million dollars. And if you're single, your price tag doesn't go down 
by half as much because things like housing and utilities and things like that, you're going to need those whether you're single or married. So the price tag can be pretty big. And you're sitting there saying, I'm going to need five and a half million dollars over this 30 years. Holy cow. I think of it much like some of the studies that maybe you've seen about how much it actually costs to have and raise a child. I don't recall what the sticker price was, but they did some study and they put it all together and it was like a significant amount of money. Enough that would make you, do I really want to sign up for that journey? For that much money when I hardly, you know, usually when you're having kids, it's early in life, you're not necessarily making the most money in your life. And it's hard to think of how am I going to afford that because of the version that you are at that time. But with kids, what ends up happening is, yeah, when you look at the price tag in today's dollars, it's huge, but how does it work? If you've had kids, you know, right? It's, you just get nickeled and dimed to death for years. <laughs> you just deal with it because it's part of having a, a family and a child. You never think of it as what the total sticker cost is. And retirement's that way too, right? That five and a half million dollar example over the lifetime, well, that's over 30 years. It's nickels and dimes in dollars year by year. What complicates the sticker shock in retirement is that unlike when you're having a kid, you feel like you have any income. So then it's like, well, how do I do that if I don't have income? And then you're looking at assets and that gets it a little bit scarier. And one thing I learned the other day, I don't think I knew this, but somebody called it out in an online meetup that we had in the club, and I mentioned this, I think, last week, is our language in how we think about retirement. Jamie Hopkins shared an example of how things are framed can really change your decisions. And he used a very simple example. Let's say that I had to go to the doctor and they found out I'm going to have to have surgery to take care of something. And the do one doctor tells me, you need the surgery and you 90% survival rate. Typically, we don't have any problems at all. Okay. But then I go get a second opinion and the doctor says, yeah, you're going to have to have surgery, but you're going to have a 10% chance of dying. Same message framed differently. First doctor, oh yeah, we have a 90% survival rate. We do these all the time. Second doctor frames it, you have a 10% chance of dying if we do the surgery. That is going to influence how you make decisions. And he used that example because we were talking about language. And let's look at the theme of this month. The theme of this month is choosing your withdrawal strategy. Well, let's look at that word withdraw. What does that word actually mean? I looked it up online and I mean, it means remove or take away something from a particular position. So when you think of money and you do a withdrawal, that's taking money away from you. And this seems subtle, but that's not very attractive. Why do I want to create a strategy to take money away from me? Withdraw it. I worked hard for that money. I don't want to withdraw it. And one of the members in the meetup put in the comments, and I thought this was really wise, they said when they talk to their spouse and they look at their 401k, they don't call it an investment portfolio or an asset. They refer to it as deferred income. So the value of the 401k is deferred income. I thought that was really smart because, yeah, it is an investment asset that you have to withdraw from. But the way that they were framing it with their language was, well, this is income that we've earned. We just deferred it so we could realize it later in retirement. And that is technically true, right? That's how you build a 401k. You defer your income, you get free money if there's a match, and that deferred income grows to a bigger pot. So when you retire, you're just realizing income that you've already earned. It's just a timing issue. That is much more attractive than what's your withdrawal strategy. Because withdrawal is taking away. I don't want anything taken away from me. What do you mean I earned that money? Oh, this is income that I deferred that I'm just now realizing. Okay, I get it. This, this seems subtle, but this really is important. So in hindsight, I shouldn't have called this choosing your withdrawal strategy. I should have called it something like your income strategy. Maybe realizing income strategy would have been a better word. 
accessing your deferred income. These words make a difference. So I just wanted to point this out because I thought that was more powerful than it appeared initially. And I think it's important that we're careful with language. Now let's turn our attention to creating a framework for you to navigate this withdrawal strategy decision. Wait a second. This income strategy decision, because words matter, right? As I've intimated throughout this series, there is no right answer. There's no one strategy fits all. There's no test you can take that says, based on this, that, and the other thing, this is the one strategy for you. It just doesn't work that way, unfortunately, which means that you really want to make sure you think about this in an organized way, because you're going to think about it in an organized way, and we're going to give you some steps. And at the end of that process, you're going to be in a much better decision to essentially make an educated guess of what feels right for you. That's as far as you're going to get. And so if you don't think about this in an organized way, that's when we can fall into trouble because we'll be sold something that someone says they know what's right for everybody, or we'll be driven by random things that happen to pop into our life and we can easily get whipshot. So what is step one in this framework that we're going to talk about? So step one is determining what income strategies are available to you given your situation. So as we described last week, I want, and it's so hard to do this without visuals, by the way, shameless plug. This is a module in the course to, with tools to help you navigate this as best we can, but you can do this on your own. So write it down, think through it, and I'll try to paint word pictures best I can. So if you recall last week, we talked about a dial. So I want you to imagine a dial and at one end is zero. And we'll call that the safety first approach, which is using money to purchase guaranteed income sources that you can't outlive through bonds and annuities and et cetera. And then all the way on the other side at 10 is safe withdrawal rates or systematic withdrawal rates, the 4% rule. You just have a contingency fund and then you sell as you need it. And then between zero and 10, there's all these little slash marks that are somewhere in between. So what you're trying to figure out is where are you within that dial of available strategies? Most likely you're in hybrid, somewhere in between, but how do you navigate that? So step one is determine what strategies are available to you. Because on a quantitative standpoint, you're going to have all the spending that you've planned out, your needs, wants, and wishes. And that equates to being a liability that you have to pay each year that you spend the money. And you have to compare that liability to the resources you have. And as we know, you have three resources to pay for retirement. We have social capital, those guaranteed income sources, pension, social security, and annuities if you have them. We have human capital, part-time work, royalties, etc. And then we have financial capital. So the first thing we need to do is compare the spending liabilities to your resources. And by doing that, you're going to be able to determine, am I overfunded? Meaning I have more assets, a significant amount more assets than I do liabilities, all my future spending. Am I constrained? They're about even or you know, a little bit, one's a little bit higher than the other. They're constrained. So it should work, but depending on how life unfolds, it could easily tilt one way or the other really quickly. And that's where most everybody is. Or am I underfunded? Oh, wow. I look at these liabilities of all the spending I'm going to have to do or want to do. And I look at my assets and yeah, I don't see how that works. Knowing where you're at on that spectrum is going to determine the menu of income strategies that are more appropriate or less appropriate for you. So as an example, let's assume we're looking at your base needs, that base decent life, good life, minimum dignity floor, and you calculate what that liability is. And then you look at all of your assets, social capital, human capital, financial capital, and you calculate, well, I'm underfunded. Well, then that is going to lean you towards certain decisions, right? Well, if you're underfunded, even though you may initially want to say, well, that means I need to take more investment risk so I can catch up. You know, that's sort of what we think about in Vegas when we're losing. If we're underfunded, I need to take more investment risk, which is Sort of makes sense, but it's really not, right? Because what you have, if you put it into the markets and you take more investment risk and do a more of a systematic withdrawal approach, now you've really increased the impact of bad markets. If you get a bad roll of the die on first few years of retirement, you just made a bad situation worse. And so this is a pickle to be in because you need 
more assets, but you really can't afford to take a lot of investment risk to go get those assets because if you are wrong or you're just unlucky, it's just going to make it worse. So if you're underfunded and in your needs category, you're probably going to want to lean much more towards zero and safety first and use the assets you have to buy as much guaranteed income sources as you can. Plus, focus on budgeting and focus on ways to increase your capital. Probably the most obvious one is part-time work, increasing your human capital to help fill the gap. So that's where you're going to fall on this table if your needs are underfunded. Now let's look at a different example. Let's say that your needs and your wants, so your dignity floor and some discretionary spending. Let's say you do this calculation and you compare your liabilities of spending to all of your asset sources and you're constrained. And we've talked about these concepts before in, in different episodes. And if you're constrained, that means you don't have to be at zero necessarily. It should work, but you're likely going to not be at between zero and 10. You're not going to be at five. Maybe you're going to lean a little bit more towards safety first. And that could be building an income floor with bonds on the early end, or it could be guaranteed income sources like an annuity, but you can still have money that is longer term to help hedge inflation and potentially give you more options if we get good markets. And because you have your needs and your wants, you have some wiggle room there in your spending based on how life unfolds. So there, you're probably going to be between zero and five or six, who knows, on the spectrum of safety first to safe withdrawal ratio. Now, if we go to the next category, let's assume that you look at your needs, wants, and your wishes and you calculate that liability of spending, and then you compare it to all of your assets. And it's very clear by the ratios that you are very overfunded. You got more than enough capital to cover pretty much all the spending you could dream of. For someone in that category, the menu is going to have all the options. You potentially could just simply do a, you could be a 10, you could do a 4% or safe withdrawal ratio. You could just have a contingency fund and then let it all be invested and then just sell strategically to keep funding things. And if you happen to get a bad sequence of return, well, because your assets are so much higher than your liabilities, you could probably absorb the shock. Plus you have some discretionary spending. So that strategy could be much more appropriate for somebody that's overfunded like that. But also, and I'll show you an example of this, you could also do a safety first approach, even though quantitatively you don't have to, but there may be other reasons that you buy guaranteed income sources. So you need to know, step one is to know where you are so you understand which ones are appropriate and which ones might lead you astray or make some iffy situation even worse. So that's the quantitative aspect of it. From here, it gets a little bit more qualitative things that we want to make sure we take into account to figure out what strategies make sense. And this is an area where there is no great tool to help evaluate this. Now, there are some tools that people are coming up with questionnaires to help you evaluate these qualitative aspects to identify personality traits, but they're emerging and they're not simple to use at the moment. So, but this is an emerging area that hopefully will be more easy to navigate in the future. But I want to at least highlight some of these things that are qualitative because these are going to inform it. So when we think of your personal profile, this is step two. You want to take a serious look at, okay, where am I at in my life? So we have external factors. Are you older? Are you making this decision when you're 70 or 75? Because if that's the case, you're probably going to have a more stable lifestyle, a better read on what life is going to look like. Plus, you're going to have a shorter period of time to solve for. And that helps from a sequence of returns. So are you older? Where are you at age-wise? Or are you 55? Where you're not quite sure what the next version is going to be, and you got a really long time frame. Those are going to skew you one way or the other. The second external profile that you want to incorporate into this is your health. Are you 70, but everybody lives to 100 and you're healthy as an ox? Well, in that case, that's going to inform whether you lean more towards safety first or towards systematic withdrawal ratio, right? You may have to hedge inflation a little bit more. And assuming that you're constrained or overfunded, you might want to still have some hedges for inflation in the mix because you know you may live a lot longer and you're healthy. Or on the flip side, if your health is low, 
let's say you're single and you're really engaged with the doctor, but you have some long-term chronic things going on and your longevity isn't average, it's way below average, then you may want to consider spending a little bit more or going a little bit more a hybrid approach because your time frame is a lot smaller. I had a, a gentleman that I worked with who passed away a few years ago and we had known each other for a very long period of time. I think I may have talked about this story a little bit, but for the last 10 years of his life, it was clear that he had a very short longevity. It was something he was very aware of. He was very proactive in his healthcare decisions and navigating this with doctors, quadruple bypasses, cancer, just all sorts of things. And so we had this hybrid strategy that was informed by the fact that he really had a short-term time horizon from a longevity standpoint. I always likened it with him of because he was a pilot trying to land an aircraft carrier in a storm because he was always pushing, hey man, I'm going to use this money. I got to live. When he did, he did really cool things. And I was always, yeah, I get that. And I understand the longevity thing. And we'd have long conversations with his last checkup on the doctor. Cause I'm like, in my mind, I didn't want to undershoot the runway and realize this guy's going to live to a hundred. And we thought it was going to be 87. And now we just crashed and burned financially because he was trying to fit life in within the time frame that he had. And he did pass. And I think we navigated that really well, but that's an example of this person was fairly overfunded for a normal lifespan, but because of the health condition, his profile there, we did much more of a hybrid approach coupled with spending. And it was a push-pull that happened every year of navigating that as he gained, gained more information on his health and as he had things that he wanted to do and how he was feeling and everything else. And so you can see how this can be a little bit more complicated, informed by health decisions and health profiles. And in his case, and this is if you say you have some of these chronic conditions, well, now you also have the increased potential for spending shocks, having a nurse come into the house or extraordinary expenses that you normally might not plan on. So this has to inform the decision. Now, another factor that's external, that's more qualitative, is your family dynamic. If you are single, well, you're the sole manager of your financial life. You don't have a husband or a wife to help be a caretaker. This is going to inform your income strategy. It may mean early on, you're more of a five in a hybrid area. But then as you get older, because you're your sole manager and you're going to be your sole caretaker, that you start to move more towards guaranteed income sources. Because if you can't manage it, it's going to be a lot easier if you have these guaranteed income sources. And if you're married, well, perhaps you have to solve because your husband is a lot younger than you. That changes the strategy because now the time frame gets increased. Or if your spouse has greater longevity and they're younger than you. On the plus side, you have a planning partner. So maybe you can be more a five for longer if it fits other parts of your decision making. And it goes to if you have children or not, right? That's a family dynamic. That can be a great support system from a health, financial management, et cetera. So that might lean you more towards hybrid than safety first, depending on the totality of your profile and your fundedness ratio. But these are things that you want to at least acknowledge and engage for yourself as you're going through this. So step two is thinking about these external factors, and you're not going to be able to score it necessarily, at least not yet, in a reliable way, but they should inform what you choose as an income strategy. One last external factor is what social capital do you have already? So let's say we're looking at your base needs and 80% are covered by your social capital because you have a pension and you have social security. Well, then you might go towards a seven or an eight. You purchase a little bit of guaranteed income sources to cover maybe the rest of your social capital. And then now you can allow the rest of it to be more quote unquote at risk in the markets because you know you have your base needs covered. This is that minimum dignity floor. So it's good to know these numbers because they help inform the decision. Now, when we talk about personal profile, now we've talked about some external ones. 
Let's talk about internal ones. So I have an example for you is I have a client who is very overfunded for retirement and they have financial capital. They have a lot of real estate with income sources. They're just in a good position. So they could literally do a safe withdrawal ratio because most of their spending, plan spending liabilities for retirement are covered by the income from the real estate, plus social security, plus a few other things that they have. And so when we look at what to do with the financial capital, in this case, even though they're way overfunded for retirement and their plan spending, they're going to be close to a zero. With them, we are looking at purchasing guaranteed income sources for life, not because they need it quantitatively, because it fits who they are. From a legacy standpoint, they have ample real estate that they plan on passing to the kids in some form. And for them, it gives them the permission that they need to not worry as much, to not worry about the markets, to not worry how things are going to happen. It fits them. And this is part of their personality profile. However you define that, they just like it. They like the security of it. This matches their personal preferences in that they don't understand markets. They don't get it. And it just makes them uncomfortable. It fits their desire to manage because they don't get markets. They get whipshod. They get fearful. They know they get fearful when they should be greedy and greedy when they should be fearful. And it just doesn't make any sense to them. And so for them, even though they're overfunded, we're leaning way towards the zero because it's going to give them the permission to be able to live the kind of life that they want. That's important. That's something that you need to factor into the mix. It doesn't matter if you're overfunded and you can do a 4% withdrawal or safe withdrawal rule or safe withdrawal strategy, income strategy, if it's going to freak you out and you're going to markets go down, you're not going to feel like you can actually go spend on that trip you wanted to go on. You got to do the strategy that's right for you. As we talked about last week, I think a good baseline is five. And then based on these steps, you can decide where you lean from zero to 10 for your initial strategy, especially if you're getting ready to retire. And the last thing I want to say about this is realize, for the most part, these are decisions you're making today. It's really important to remember that none of this is forever decisions, but by going through an organized way to create your income strategy, it's going to give you a framework to start acting off of. And it's also going to give you a framework so you can make adjustments as you grow in your life. I have plenty of clients in my practice where we started off one way and now we're we've iterated and made lots of changes to where we're at on this dial, this theoretical dial from zero to 10 over the years based on their personal profile, external factors, quantitative factors, etc. So although this is an important decision, you're free to change. And that means don't take it too seriously because it's important we get to a strategy because that's going to be your baseline to iterate off of. And with that, what we're going to do is next, we're going to go chat with Andy Panko and just talk about this decision on income strategies. And then we'll go to Coach's Corner and talk with Kevin Lyles from the club. So to help conclude this episode, I have the amazing Andy Panko. Uh, Hello. Hey, Hey, Andy. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. How about yourself? By the way, I had... So much fun on your Facebook Live that was it, like three weeks ago now on taxes and is it taxes and retirement? Give me that name again. The Facebook correct name. taxes and retirement on Facebook. Yep, it reminded me of a lot of the things we do in the Rock Retirement Club. In that we just have, in your case, I don't know how many hundreds of people on, and we're talking retirement taxes purpose, and then real time just questions keep coming in, and we just try to answer them technically, but also give people frameworks to make their own decision. So much. Exactly. 
Yeah, no, it was definitely appreciate you being on. There was lots of great engagement and, and questions from the members, and I know they all appreciate it as well. So thank you for that. So I have a question for you before we get into withdrawal strategies. Why do you think there are so many people that come to those live free events that you do every week? Why do you think they come and they're so engaged? They are trying to simplify and find rightfully so, find succinct, clean, easy to understand answers for their financial lives. Because all of these things we do, we talk about are admittedly incredibly complex between taxes and distributions and investments. And there's so many moving parts and variables that many people, even with a, with a decent level of understanding how all this works, still feel overwhelmed and, and kind of freeze up and, and don't know how to pull it all together to culminate in how much money should I take out when and from where. So they come looking for answers. And, and to the best of our abilities, we, we try to give clean, concise answers if and where possible. But a lot of times the answer is literally, it depends with lots of caveats behind it. So you and I were talking about this episode on talking about how to choose your withdrawal strategy. The first reaction, well, it depends, right? It depends yep. on so many things. Do you think it, on this show, we answer tons of questions on your lives, you answer tons of questions. Do you think it's helpful? When people are asking these tactical optimization questions that are one-offs, do you think it's helpful to give them an answer or does that just automatically beg the next tactical? Well, and then what about this? What about that? And then it never ends. It's true. It never ends, but I think there's still value in it. Someone asks a technical question, we give an answer, try to make it as digestible as possible. And it does beget the next question. And that's the downside. It's this kind of hamster wheel that doesn't stop. But the upside, I guess, is it helps demonstrate to people and, and helps educate people just how complicated and intertwined all these things are and all the things you need to consider. Now, that does kind of exacerbate the problem for some people where they're overwhelmed to start with by answering a question with another question further kind of complicates it and makes them freeze up. But I mean, it is what it is to be frank, right? We're not hiding anything. We're not trying to make this seem like it's simpler and easier than it actually is. But I also like to think I'm not fear-mongering or, or trying to scare people into the complexities or this is why you need to hire someone or whatever. I'm just telling it how it is. This is the way I like to think of it. Yeah. And I think a lot of like when we get to this withdrawal strategy decision, there is literally no right or wrong answer, right? There is just versions of what is most appropriate, but it could be, I could have the fish or the chicken. I'm, I'm going to probably be okay anyway, as long as I've done the big rocks, the bigger fundamental things. Correct. I think a lot of people would, in some sense, appreciate having all of their money just be in the form of a paycheck. So social security, pension, if you got one and or annuities. So at one extreme, if you want to get rid of all of this, what ifs and guesswork and distribution malarkey, take every single dollar of investable assets you have and go buy annuities. So I'm not advocating actually doing that, but if you did, you know with certainty exactly how much you're getting every month from social security and or pension and or annuity. It shows up. That's that. Now, as you know, there's lots of downsides, you know, with it, well, you give up so stuff, low. right? You give, you give up, up lots of stuff for that yeah. simplicity. Yeah. Exactly. But that's sort of one extreme of you get rid of all this decision making you need to do around distributing when and from where and why. But you give up a lot. You give up flexibility. You give up any potential for market gains. You give up lots of ability to uh, you know, leave a legacy. Inflation, you know, if there's massive inflation, your annuity that, that doesn't have any sort of inflation adjustment is, is not going to do you well over the long term. So it's not as simple as I make it sound, but that's sort of one extreme of if you want to get rid of all the noise, you just do that. Practically, that, that's not going to work for virtually everybody. So you, you can't do that. Try to get something close to that is ideal. And I know you do this as well. You map out your needs, your wants, your wishes, and try to sort of tick and tie the, the needs at least with guaranteed sources of income like social security, pension, perhaps annuity. And then the rest, kind of the fun money, the spicy stuff, you can have a little more discretion over and um, do traditional portfolio withdrawals instead of having to lock that up with guaranteed secured income. And so when you're thinking through this with someone, say in your practice, how do you organize it to help them figure out where they are in that dial that I talk about between safety first and just 4%? Yeah, that's tough. And there's no single approach. Part of it depends on the client's views and thoughts and opinions towards things. Some people are, are very comfortable having their 
future finances be invested in the market. They understand sequence of return. They understand they're no longer accumulating and saving, but they're still fundamentally okay with that. Other folks, not so much. And they want and need more of that safety first approach. So, so that really all depends. My general view is similar to yours and similar to other folks who have the minimum dignity floor concept. The things you absolutely know you're going to have to spend, housing, taxes, insurance, food, et cetera. Ideally, you want that matched and you know paired off with lifetime secure income, of which there's only three, social security, pensions, and or annuity. Well, also, you could just simply build the income floor on the front end, right? CDs, bonds that mature when you need the money. Yes, you can do that laddering, quote unquote, laddering concept. Yeah, man, just, just even think it through that question. Like, There is no right way. I personally don't do laddering. I get it. I understand it. I know some people like to see, okay, my next year's expenses are covered by this bond maturing in a year or this bullet ETF maturing in a year. And then you could do the same for two, three, four years. I guess if someone wants that, we can definitely do that. My view is generally, and this is where it gets more complicated, is I try to layer in tax planning throughout all this distribution. And that's going to depend year by year based on what the financial markets are doing, based on how tax legislation goes, et cetera. So you want to sort of stay flexible, meaning let's assume by the end of this year, we know there's going to be tax increases and they're, they're materializing and we have a very good handle what they're going to look like and when. Maybe we have to start realizing some capital gains now that we otherwise didn't have to. So that's going to change the income plan. Now your income's going to come from selling this big chunk of stock you bought 30 years ago. And then there's unknowns. Maybe there's some other tax provision we don't even know is going to exist, will exist. You know, Things like Irma come out of nowhere at some point. Things like the net investment income tax, not to get too nerdy here, but you know something like that could manifest itself where all of a sudden that changes the plan of where we take money from, when and why. Well, I think all of those things get picked up in iteration, right? But you have to have a base plan to have, say, liquidity to, well, one, just give you your paycheck and make you feel comfortable. And then that gives you liquidity to change it later on. So let's talk a little bit about tax planning. I think that's an important part here. And I had a question the other day, like one question, if you retire before 65 is, do I try to qualify for say ACA subsidies or do I do Roth conversions? So what is an organized way in your mind of how you think through that? Part of it is going to depend on how much tax deferred money do you have and therefore kind of how potentially bad is your future tax problem. The worse that is, the more you'd want to lean towards, okay, maybe we do conversions now to help minimize that. Even if doing those conversions mean you're, you're jacking up your adjusted gross income to the point that you are partially or completely phasing out your ability to get ACA premium tax credit subsidies. So we kind of have to do the math and see someone is reasonably able to keep their reported gross income at 20 grand or so that, you know, they're going to get the maximum amount of ACA credits. And if that's two grand a month, let's just say I'm making up a number, $24,000 a year in hand is hard to give up bird in the hand, two in the bush kind of thing. I'd be hard pressed to say, yes, forget those ACA credits. Let's go ahead and do Roth conversions for some unknown, anticipated, hoped for future tax savings, right? Like, do you want to give up 24 grand a year to save hopefully some unknown amount in the future? That's tough. I'd lean towards squeezing the most juice as possible out of those ACA credits in that case. Because that but, is really, and some of that would be, well, are you 58 or are you 63, right? Are you just going to get yeah. two years of juice today? It is. And isn't it true? Ultimately, you're not going to know. No, that's the difficulty with this. And it pains me to say it because people always want clean answers, defensible, quantifiable answers. And when it comes to tax planning, there's so many unknowns that it's impossible to say. I always tell people, if you can tell me with certainty when you're going to die, exactly how much you'll have to spend every year, what the financial markets are going to do, you know, stocks, bonds, interest rates, whatever, and what inflation is going to do, and how tax legislation is going to change. Tell me those with certainty over the next 30 years, and I will make you a bulletproof, rock solid income distribution plan. But we don't know. So the kind of best we can do is diversify things as much as possible, not just diversify investments, but diversify taxability. And that's where Roth conversions come into play. If 95% of your retirement savings is tax deferred money, you don't have a lot of tax diversity because every dollar you take out will be taxed. So let's try to spread that around a little bit, get some more in Roth, get some more in traditional taxable brokerage accounts if possible. You know, when I think about this, and I love how I can ask you a question and we didn't know I was going to ask you that question. 
Uh, you just sort of have to think through it logically. As you were talking, and I was thinking about this ACA subsidy thing in terms of withdrawal strategies, I was thinking of some client examples. And I have clients where we are solving for ACA. We're intentionally doing the withdrawal strategy to get the subsidy. Mm-hmm. And then I have clients that are doing the exact opposite. And the two that come to mind are relatively comparable asset level wise, spending wise, as I think of it. And a lot of it comes down to, I'm trying to think through each one and the decision that led to that. Some of it just comes down to what they internally value most, right? Yes. And how they think of the money and in the ACA end of it, it makes sense for them to get that because it's going to allow them to do other things, whether it's defer social security, well, not so, not social security, but to defer taking money. So it, it gives them something by getting that thousand dollars a month in ACA subsidies for the other ones they are thinking much longer term and more multi-generational where the other one isn't. Right. But I think the key there, and hopefully what we, we talked about in this episode is you just want to think about it in an organized way. I think that's really the key, isn't it? It's like, because there's going to be a lot of different things, but you just have to organize it so you're not just bopping around. Yes. Get it organized. Be aware of the pros and the cons and definitely be cognizant of hindsight will be 2020. And that will tell us what the best decision would have been. As long as you're aware of those things and think through it, there is no right or wrong answer. There's just different choices and choices have their consequences, some of which won't be known until after the fact. So, so that's what I do with clients is talk through it. And to your point, some have different feelings and views. Like I know of some folks who, whether it's distrust of the government or just distrust of taxes, will kind of shoot off their nose to spite their face and do massive amounts of conversions today, probably pay more tax than they need to today for the sake of and the comfort of, I don't have to worry about this in the future because I don't trust what's going to happen in the future. And that's the right answer for them. And I also think when we're, especially on the tax planning part of withdrawal strategy, it is one of the biggest levers we have to enhance or optimize the plan, right? Because I'm looking at one right now where we're considering doing Roth conversions up to the 24% bracket over seven years. And estimates are that it will save about 200 grand in taxes Mm -hmm. if they did that relative to the alternative of taking money out of IRAs to pay for life, right? Because then, you know, if we do the Roth conversions, they have money to pay the tax and then they can access after tax assets. These are real dollar decisions But I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves, this is in the optimization bucket where if we screw this all up or if we're wrong, we probably won't even realize it after the fact and our life will still be great, right? It's not a high stakes, will I die or not in retirement or will I run out of money or not typically. Right. I definitely agree with that. There's a few fundamental things to get right. Having a good handle on your expenses and basic cash flow projections, getting your asset allocation correct is, is vitally important. You know, you mess that up, you can do a lot of damage. This, this finer level, kind of uh, higher level thing that we're doing with this tax optimization is just that. I, I like to think it, it can and hopefully should help people eke out some extra net of tax usage of their money, whether it's for them or for their heirs. But that's what we're solving for and trying to do here. If we, if we get this wrong, it's not going to massively derail someone's plan. But if we get it right, it should help make it that much better. Exactly. And I think that's a great way to end it And when it comes to tax implications. So we went around a lot of different places here. And I appreciate you thinking through this. And you can see, because Andy thinks about this, I think, very intentionally. I know I do. And you can see the two of us are not sure for each person. And it becomes much is much of a quantitative decision. Or it is definitely a quantitative decision. But there's so much qualitative stuff that has to be factored in. And there's not really a reliable way of measuring that other than having conversations, whether it's with you and your spouse or you and your advisor or whatever it is. It's just to, I think the big thing to avoid is to be like a kid in a candy store and see attractive things and go grab that one and then go grab that one and not do it in an organized way. Right. I think people like myself are partly to blame for talking so much about Roth conversions and Roth this and Roth that and taxes. And it makes people feel like I need to be taking some action. Like I hear a lot of buzz about Roth conversions. I need to do them. And maybe you don't. I actually had a call with a potential client a couple of weeks ago who was dead set on having to do conversions. And after a 10 minute conversation, it's pretty clear. You don't have to. You're in fine position. You have a relatively small amount of tax deferred assets. You're good. And after talking through it, you realize, you know what? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm, I'm done with my multi-year conversion plan. 
So I try to not beat the drum too much, or at least I try to give the disclaimer that, you know, you don't have to do conversions and they don't make sense for everyone, et cetera. But I am still here to kind of spread the word about how they work, when they can make sense and, and let people decide whether or not it's right for them. Can we do like a sidebar rant for a second? Oh, I love rants. Okay. Let's go. It won't be. This is, for, this is with all of us here. And Kevin Lyles posted it in the club the other day, article about something. This is just my personal opinion. So, and I get those the same type of thing. I read about this. The tax bomb is coming. What about this, this, that, and the other thing? And this may be a jaded view. Almost all public retirement, quote unquote, education or information is designed to lead you somewhere, either to call them or to scare you. And it's such a disservice because the, I think the internet is just this big infomercial and there's enough stuff in a lot of the content we read that either scares us or gets us motivated about something, but then nobody ever shows you how to actually do anything. It's all clickbaity. Right. It's true that about everything, but I definitely think in retirement planning, it causes so much more stress than actually helping people. It really does. That bothers me. I hate sales in the traditional sense. There's definitely a lot of clickbait YouTube videos and Facebook ads and book promotions about the tax time bomb and this and that. And behind the scenes, yes, a lot of it is to funnel you to buy their book, to buy their insurance products that can minimize your downside and dampen volatility and you know still give you all these other benefits or hire them for their consulting services. And I'd be lying if I were to say I'm not in the business of giving advice about this, but I, I like to think I try to avoid making my content and my speeches a pitch of any sort. I'm just here to educate. You do with that information as you please, but I'm trying to give it as unbiased and straightforward and sort of professorial as I can. Professorial. Well, Professorial and I, word. <laughs> it's a good question. It is to me because I make them up all the time. Yeah. And you call it out. And I think of this show that's gone on for seven years. My business has prospered as a result of it. And I talk about the RC. Sometimes I get emails and I talk about the RC too much. And sometimes I'm not, what is the RC? And I walk the line of, I don't want to sell, but I do want to make sure people are aware of things and be professorial in mm -hmm. nature and be an active thinker. And not just simply lead people. But yeah, I mean, that we'll have to call each other out in the sense that, you know, although in my advisory practice, I'm not accepting clients anymore. So it feels almost better, right? Because then I don't have that <laughs> right. potential conflict, but I have the RC. And so we try to at least be cognizant of it and not be that way. Exactly. But, and I think that definitely shows a lot of people can see right through a Billy Mays type of ass scene on TV infomercial for, for something. Other but then why do I still want to buy that when I see him? I don't, but why sure? do I? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's a, I mean, that's a I, Roger I, issue. I, I have buckets of OxyClean right here in my <laughs> washroom now. So I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone about buying that stuff. But yeah, I don't know. Human nature, I guess. A good salespeople know the buttons to push and, and the levers to pull to entice you, to engage you, to get you interested. So there, there is something to it, but I try to avoid that for what it's worth. Well, Andy, I appreciate you hanging out with us to close out this choosing your withdrawal strategy and helping us think in an organized way. Now, next month, we're going to spend an entire month talking about women in retirement. And we're going to try to approach it with an open mind and think through it. And we're going to have Tanya Nichols on here because it'd be silly for me to do it by myself. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. Andy, I'm excited to see you in the club and thanks for hanging out. Thanks for having me. It's always a fun time. Well, welcome to Courts' Corner with our head of education in the Rock Retirement Club, Kevin Lyles. Hey, Kevin, how you doing, man? Good, Roger. Now, Kevin, we talked a lot this week about where you fall on the dial between safety first, safe withdrawal rates, the hybrid approach. And we talked about language. Is it a withdrawal? Is it deferred income? Why is figuring out the right withdrawal strategy so important for someone? Yeah. And you know, Roger, I like to go to sort of the softer side. So I don't like to get into the numbers too much. I think it's important because we've saved money for our entire careers. And then we get to retirement and we have to go into a different mode. So I think choosing the right approach is so important because you need to give yourself permission to spend the money that you've saved. So that key thing is you need to find a strategy or framework that gives yourself permission. Why is permission such a big thing? Is it just hard to spend money? It is hard to spend money when you know there's not more coming in. 
you've gotten used to spending money through your working life because you had a paycheck coming in every two weeks and you retire and you think there's no more paychecks. Now I'm just drawing down from my savings and that's going to deplete. And so, yes, you worry about it. So I think an approach is needed that you'll give yourself permission and it'll be a different approach for different people. I chose a safety first approach. So define that that in your terms, because this is something that you've explored a lot more than I do. I came traditionally as an advisor for more of the safe withdrawal rate. And I think I've changed from that. I'm somewhere in between, but you chose a safety first. So define what that really means for you. Sure. And you're right. It means different things to different people. For me, I wanted to know that our expected spending is covered by guaranteed income sources. And that's a mix of pension, social security, and annuity that I purchased. And so you that you used- took financial assets and created guaranteed payments that you know will cover what you expect to pay for a base good life. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly right. And for me, that was very helpful because now I know that amount of money, the amount I think I'm going to spend, we're going to spend, is coming in guaranteed for life. So that for me got rid of the normal inclination to save more money. So I'm happy to spend that money. In fact, if I'm not spending that money and you know, during the COVID year, it was hard to spend that money. You're thinking, what can I do with it? Because I don't want to save more. I've got the portfolio. One of the rules, and I got this from you, is you need to remain agile. In other words, you don't know when you're, I retired at 55, you don't know what your 65-year-old self is going to want to spend. And so I think you need to not go all in with safety first. I would never suggest put all of your money into an annuity because you don't know. You need to remain agile. So in my mind, when I was looking at it, I sort of had, I don't think you should put more than 25 to 40% or so of your investment monies into guaranteed income approach. And when we talk about annuities with safety first, generally we're talking about the organic kind, right? The deferred income annuity or single premium income annuity, where it's not the variable with all the the complications or are those included too? Correct. When I was shopping for an annuity, I purchased one based on the highest guaranteed lifetime income level. Okay. And frankly, some variable annuities, even though I don't like them generally as products, they can actually offer higher guaranteed income level. I didn't choose one of those, but I understand that they can because they're so profitable for the insurance companies. Sometimes they guarantee more income. So how did you determine that this approach was the one that fit you? Because I know I'm a worrier. And I didn't want to worry anymore about money. In other words, I was retiring early. I wasn't forced out. I could have kept working. And in my mind, I told myself, well, you can't do that and risk your financial security for your family. So that for me, I knew I wanted that security to help justify my decision for retiring early. Okay. So that helped give you permission. It absolutely did for in my case. Yeah. The visual I always have when we go from accumulation to living on the monies that we've built is, and why it's so hard for people is the people that like you have been such diligent savers and earners, the muscle, it's like a bodybuilder who's really big up top. And that's the accumulation, saving, denying yourself is just walking around and they're just stout. But then they get into retirement and they need to use their leg muscles, which is running around and creating a great life. But they've never used those muscles. And they're like, you know, little twigs that they have to develop in terms of giving yourself permission to spend. Now, you disclosed to me that you've been giving yourself more permission to spend. So I guess you're developing those muscles. Yeah, I'm evolving. And I think the safety first approach really helped me to get there. But I paid a lot more attention to what things cost during my working life when I had an income than I do now in retirement. And I think it's because then I always felt the more I save, the better off I'm going to be. You know, that was the objective. Save and grow, save and grow. Well, now my objective is lifestyle. It's to have the best retirement lifestyle for me that I can have. So it's a different approach. And yeah, I'm, I still 
backslide occasionally and find myself nickel and diming over some decision or but overall i feel like i'm getting there that i'm not thinking much about what i'm spending for things yeah and the key here is for you listening you need to find the strategy that fits who you are and i think the other part of this kevin that we don't talk about a lot is this isn't a lifetime decision. You can start on one path because it fits where you're at and then pivot to become more safety first or have more money is invested or whatever. It's not a irrevocable decision as long as you keep some agility in your decision like you have, right? Yeah, that's very important that you do that. And frankly, you know, one criticism I've heard of the safety first approach is you get rid of agility. And my answer is, well, not if you only invest, in my case, I said 25 to 40%. If you limit it to that, you keep a lot of flexibility and agility in your remaining portfolio. But the other thing that I think people don't realize is you're not really locking in your lifestyle when you adopted safety first approach. You're just locking in an income level. I fully expect that what I'm spending our money on now, I'll be spending on different things 10 years from now because our wants and needs will change. So I'm just locking in an income level, not a lifestyle. Yeah, and it's been very interesting, the journey of Kevin in the club and us having lots of debates and lots of discussions about this because we generally, you can hear Kevin, he chose something that is right for him and he is very passionate about the safety first approach. He's not the poster child for it, but he gets the logic of that. And I started somewhere in between and we've generally started to work to get to a middle and that's okay. And I think that's part of why we have shows like this and the club and things like that is because you're going to have to test, try on a couple of different of these conceptually in your planning to figure out which one fits where you're at. I definitely believe that, Roger. One size does not fit all. And I think if someone is completely comfortable having five years of safe money, if you will, and they're comfortable with that and comfortable spending, go for it. Everyone will have different preferences. Which sort of leads me to, and I would love your opinion on this, because I believe you actually use an advisor to an extent, mm -hmm. is if you decide you're going to work with an advisor, one of the things you should look for is someone that is not boxed into, I have one strategy, this is the strategy I use with everybody, so we're going to use it with you too, because that is going to preclude you potentially of finding a strategy that actually is a lot better fit for you. Yeah, I completely agree that you need an advisor. The advisor doesn't run the show. You need to run the show. You need to take responsibility for the decisions. I use an advisor as a sounding board for helping point out mistakes I'm making or points of view I'm not considering. But I would never just turn it over and say, whatever you think, because that won't work for me. I have a situation right now where this is a really good example of someone that is, we're doing an extreme, we'll call it safety first approach, where we are building guaranteed income sources with financial assets coupled with real estate that they already own. And this approach fits them because they don't understand markets. They have no interest in markets. It scares them and they have ample cash reserves. So it has less to do with finances because they're wealthy enough that they could just simply do a safe withdrawal rate and probably still have lots of excess, but it would scare the heck out of them. It doesn't fit who they are. So we're doing an extreme, we're way on that end of the dial for them. Whereas other clients are, it's exactly the opposite. Well, and that's the benefit of having an advisor like you, Roger. And I know you don't like to tout your services at all on the podcast, but it's having an advisor who will listen and work with their clients as individuals rather than an approach. And it's one of the concerns I have. You know, a lot of the big brokerages now have these subscription models. Pay us $300 a year and you can talk to a CFP whenever you want. I'm not sure you're going to get that kind of service in that model. So if you need an advisor to really work with you and get an approach that works for you, I think you've got to look for a, an advisor who has that kind of a model. Or find something that can help you create it yourself and navigate that. Shows yes. like this, I'm not going to plug the Rock Retirement Club because I probably talk about that too much. I will say it does feel comfortable with the show and is that the fact that I, we're not accepting any new clients, I feel much more like I don't worry about it because we're not accepting anybody. So there's no, definitely no sales on that end. You're less conflicted. It feels less <laughs> conflicted. It does. Sure.
I think very wise. This is a great way to end this series because it's not as clear cut as an article you might read makes it. You like in your life are going to have to find your own path that fits who you are. That's right. And what I've enjoyed about your series this month, Roger, is presenting the options and people will move along that continuum of options. And if you work at it, you can find the approach that works best for you. And that's what it's all about. Amen, brother. Thanks for coming on, man. Good to talk to you. On your marks, get set. And we're off to take a little baby step you can take in the next seven days to not just rock retirement, but rock life. So in the next seven days, in relation to determining this income strategy, just take a notebook and map out how you think about where you're at fundedness wise, if you have a read on that, and then start to map out some of the qualitative things. And that's going to activate you thinking about this stuff. You don't have to make this a big essay, but just use the different steps and the things that I brought up to start to map it out. So you can start to be introspective as you navigate this. So you can figure out where you want to be on the dial. So next week, we are starting our series on women in retirement with Tanya Nichols. So if you have questions or insights on the subject, cool if you're a guy, obviously, if you're a lady, go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger. And I'll say this next week, but I'm going to say it now. Like every topic, the way that we're going to approach this is from a micro level. What, based on who you are, does this mean and how do you navigate this for you? Not going to touch on macro opinions, on policy, history, etc. I'll leave that to plenty of other people that are doing it. My concern is how do you navigate it for your life? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. I'm excited to explore this topic with you and with Tanya. And I hope you have a great uh, rest of July. <laughs> Talk to you next week. Hey, it's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too, but remember you're not our client. We would not love it if you took advice from yeah, us on we the would show. Not, we would not love it if you took advice from us on the show. Realize this is helpful in some education. Talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.